I've wondered almost every single day of my life what else could be out there. Haven't you? Haven't you? Space is a vast ocean of truly gargantuan scale. Amongst that immense darkness, peppered with billions of stars, trillions of worlds, we wonder, could there be others out there? But knowing where, when, and how to listen eludes us. There could be thousands of messages washing over our planet right now, unimaginable wealths of knowledge drifting between our fingertips. But we simply haven't figured out what we should be looking for. Are we doomed to never truly hear? Are we fated to always be alone? Provocatively, the solution to our dilemma might lie within a thought experiment from game theory. Consider the following problem. You are instructed to meet with a total stranger somewhere in the US. You are not given the time, the date, nor even the location. And your life depends upon successfully making this meeting. And indeed, their life too also depends on this. It seems like an almost hopeless task, but remarkably, there is some hope. You know that this person is presumably another rational entity who doesn't want to die and so will do their best to succeed in this task. Since we're in the US, they're presumably familiar with American culture and geography. Now, there's no single answer to this puzzle, but a reasonable guess might be to pick New York City as a meeting point, being the most populous, economically active, and famous city in the country. Now, let's think about time. Rather than picking some arbitrary calendar date or time, you might want to pick a moment that stands out. The most obvious choice would be New Year's Eve at midnight, but exactly where should you meet in New York? There's a few possible options. You could meet right here in Times Square, but it's pretty busy. It'd be very difficult to find that stranger. Perhaps a better option might be the Empire State Building. Yes, there's a lot of floors to cover and plenty of people, but it's one of the most well-known landmarks in the city. Or maybe you might try Grand Central Station, right by the famous clock. Because this point in time and space is special, and in game theory, it's known as a shelling point. The ABC network actually did a modified version of this experiment. No one's lives are at risk and they had multiple chances, but remarkably, after just a few hours, strangers did successfully meet at the Empire State Building. Uh, are you looking for two over. people from ABC News? <laughs> yes. Are so are we. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst game theory might at first seem rather irrelevant to the field of astronomy, these shelling points have become the subject of increasing discussion within the community. In particular, astronomers attempting to detect the communications from alien civilizations, often dubbed SETI, realized just how crucial these focal points are in their search. It was economist Thomas Schelling who first described these in his 1960 book, The Strategy of Conflict, writing that people can often concert their intentions or expectations with others if each knows that the other is trying to do the same. Now, I don't think that Schelling had aliens in mind, but the same philosophy actually holds true. Because if we're going to try and search for alien transmissions, then it helps if both parties have a central focus to hone in on else the search area is simply too vast. The idea of a focal point like this is actually not new to SETI. Indeed, even in what is arguably the first serious SETI paper by Morrison and Conconi in 1959, they suggest that radio searchers should focus their efforts on one frequency in particular. To quote, there lies a unique, objective standard of frequency which must be known to every observer in the universe. The outstanding radio emission line at 1420 megahertz of neutral hydrogen. This was later coined the radio waterhole, but it's really a radio frequency shelling point. Why so? Well, hydrogen is the simplest element possible, and it is the most common element in the universe. 
yet more, its emission line, caused by the spin flip of its single electron, lives almost exactly where the universe is naturally quietest in the radio. So this really does seem like a perfect choice. Of course, the problem here is that how can one be sure that aliens would arrive at the same conclusion? Well, one modification to this is to not just search at that one hydrogen line, but to search at all of the integer multiples of that hydrogen frequency. And indeed, that has become a fairly common strategy in modern SETI. But maybe aliens don't think of hydrogen as fundamental at all, as strange as that might sound to us. One alternative radio shelling point was recently suggested by friend of the channel, Professor Jason Wright. Wright suggests that Planck units might be the key. Planck units are combinations of the fundamental constants of the universe that give the various basic dimensions like distance, time, and energy. Max Planck himself called them natural units since, and I quote, they remain meaningful for all times and for all extraterrestrial and non-human cultures. If aliens know about the fundamental constants, then they should also know about the Planck frequency. Energy and frequency are interchangeable when we're talking about light because the energy of a photon is simply the Planck's constant h multiplied by the frequency of light. And it's here that we see the problem, because the Planck frequency, or correspondingly the Planck energy, is rather extreme. It corresponds to an energy of 10 to the power 28 electron volts. That's far more energetic than the most energetic photons known, let alone detectable. To get around this, Wright suggests that they would multiply this energy by the fine structure constant repeatedly, creating a kind of comb of Planck frequencies to search through. Now, that's not a totally arbitrary choice. The fine structure constant with a value of about 1 over 137 is a constant that is fundamental to electromagnetic radiation, such as radio emissions. You can see here the final list of possible frequencies, many of which fall within the range of various existing detectors. Crucially, you'll notice that none of these are particularly close to the hydrogen line used by SETI for decades at 1420 megahertz. So perhaps we've been looking at the wrong shelling point all along. Choosing the right radio frequency is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to shelling points in SETI. After all, one might question whether radio is really the right part of the spectrum to be looking at, what bandwidth they might use, and even whether electromagnetic radiation is the right medium to be considering at all. And going further, what about shelling points in space and in time? The actual method of transmission is a topic for which we have identified no clear shelling point, or should I say shelling method. There's a general consensus that the transmission should use something which propagates as fast as possible, that is, at or close to the speed of light. So this gives us electromagnetic radiation, i.e. light, as a natural contender. But that's not the only option. What about gravitational waves or neutrinos? These two have certainly aroused interest within the SETI community, but our difficulty in detecting these means that they've largely been a fringe topic. It's a bit like suggesting that the peak of the highest US mountain, Denali in Alaska, as a meeting point to our initial stranger problem. Sure, it's a special place being the highest peak, but it's highly inaccessible to most humans. But perhaps to a highly advanced civilization, that peak isn't particularly challenging, nor is using neutrinos any more challenging than using light. Plus, it would have the added advantage of filtering out those less advanced species that they might not be interested in talking to anyway. And of course, one could even go further than this and imagine a hyper-advanced civilization embedding their messages into something even more fundamental. Could they inscribe their messages into the cosmic microwave background, or arrange the pulsars around us into a particular pattern, or even codify their messages within the fundamental constants of the universe itself. It's easy to fall down the rabbit hole here and muse on ever more speculative ideas. But if we come back to the original shelling idea, then I think we can largely discard these more exotic ideas. 
if the other party's modus operandi is one of vastly greater capabilities to that of ourselves, then a meetup may be frankly unlikely to ever happen. It would be a bit like taking that original example of meeting a total stranger in the US, but replacing that person with, let's say, a pigeon. It's pretty unlikely that we're going to have any agreement about what an obvious time or place to meet up would be. Yet more, they are plausibly far less interested in us anyway, nor would we have the ability to reply to them in the same way. I'm skeptical that we can even define a shelling point if the other party is assumed to be far, far more advanced than that of ourselves. No. Better, I think, to focus on communicating with a less advanced party, one that has a greater intuition about our own abilities and thus would choose a point that we too would naturally consider to be a shelling point. And on that basis, electromagnetic radiation is the clear winner. It's a technology we've been using for communication for more than a century, yet it travels at the speed of light largely unimpeded through space. A final topic I want to discuss here is space and time. Let's start with space. Shelling points in space are perhaps most naturally the stars. Yes, there's a lot of them, but we can at least hone in to specific locations on the sky. One might consider looking towards the galactic center, the time square of the galaxy, but this raises the practical problem of how the other party would move their transmitter into that line of sight unless they just happen to live there. Whilst this is perhaps within the realms of a highly advanced species, it's certainly not something that we could ever imagine doing for a very long time. So if we just return to the stars then, is there anything else that we could do here to focus in on an interesting subsample of them? Several groups have suggested that stars which have the correct position in the sky, such that they can see the Earth eclipse or transit in front of the Sun, could be just that. These stars essentially lie within about half a degree of the ecliptic plane, the plane in which the Earth orbits the Sun. Professors Lisa Kautenegger and Jackie Faherty recently calculated that there are 1,715 stars that are within 100 parsecs and that have been in that zone long enough to have witnessed the beginnings of human civilization. Yet more, 75 of these have already had human radio leakage wash over them, so they may already know about our technology. Professor Eamon Kerens takes this a step further, highlighting that some of these Earth transit zones will not only see Earth transit, but we could see them transit too. This happens if their alignment in space happens to be coincidental with our own. Like a geometrical bridge, they can see us and we can see them. So in principle, both parties could detect life on each other. Kerens has even suggested that this setup disarms the usual resistance to broadcasting one's presence, since now both parties can quite easily find each other regardless. With methodology and space covered, we are now finally ready to get into shelling points in time. Now, sure, an obvious strategy is that one could just broadcast your signal out into the universe continuously, but that would be a rather expensive enterprise. Perhaps instead, civilizations save up their resources for one loud bang into the dark that would be much more easily detected. But then that raises the obvious problem, how do we synchronize the transmitter and the receiver to have a chance of actually catching that signal? In our example of meeting a stranger, New Year's Eve worked because we all know the calendar, but there's no such calendar for the galaxy. For example, each star has a different location and thus orbital period around the galactic center. One suggestion in the literature is to use high energy astrophysics events as synchronization times. Gamma ray bursts are a great example of this, since they're fairly common, they have short durations, are bright and appear all over the sky. In principle, they may be predictable too, since several merging black holes observed by LIGO were subsequently found to produce such bursts. Another suggestion is to come back to the Earth transit zone idea. Here, there is a special moment in time. When the planet passes in front, transits its star, we have such a special moment, such a shelling point. 
I've even built upon this idea myself by suggesting that even if the geometry of that system is not correct for a transit, we could still measure and predict the planetary motion around that star and thus define special orbital moments when we could search for these signals. For example, the moment of inferior conjunction is when the planet is physically closest to us in space, which is where transits would occur if the alignment were correct. Another suggestion might be the quadrature points of the orbit, or perhaps even times related to the orbit of a possible moon around that planet. So as hopefully you've been able to see then, whether we're discussing the how, the where, or the when, there is no one singular unambiguous clear shelling point. But then if we think about it, going back to that earlier example of meeting a stranger somewhere in the US, that also wasn't true there either. But unlike our meeting the stranger case, we don't have to risk it all on a single bet. We can lay down several hedges on the board, watching multiple locations at multiple times in multiple ways. Still a focused search, but one that gives us a better chance of picking the right shelling point. But I want to hear what you think. Do you think that aliens would indeed use shelling points to transmit to us? And indeed, which of these do you think has the best chance of success? Perhaps a fun question for the comments is, can you think of a shelling point on the internet? For me, shelling points have a certain romanticism about them, like two long lost lovers trying to reconnect. Not sure where they moved to or even how long it's been, but perhaps visiting their old haunts, the street that they grew up on, the bus they used to ride, in desperate hope of trying to catch them once more. Despite the enormous challenge, the seemingly slim chance of success, we're compelled to try. Because as hard and as hopeless as this journey may sometimes feel, there may very well be someone out there right now, desperately trying to make contact with us. And like so many things in life, the moment that we decide to stop is the moment that we've committed to failure. So until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious. Thank you so much for watching everybody. We actually have a couple of SETI projects ongoing in our research team right now. If you want to help us out, you can click the link up above and become a supporter to the Cool Worlds Lab right here at Columbia University. Just like one of our latest donors, I want to thank Ian Attard. Thank you so much for your support, Ian. All right, have a cosmically awesome day out there, and I'll see you